from from so many uh, from so many uh, um, from so many lectures before. Ethical hacking is another process that contains uh, stages, and every stages will lead us to a compromise a given target. So this is what we covering today. We covering today which stages we have in ethical hacking, and how they are working together to compromise uh, a machine. But before we really study ethical hacking, I like to really emphasize about why. Why we study ethical hacking? Why we study uh, penetration testing? Okay, why we really need to do this stuff? And the whole idea here, guys, is to really identify vulnerabilities on your system, on your application, on your websites before the bad guys do. Because if you don't really um, identify this kind of vulnerabilities, what will happen is this vulnerability will become a point that the attacker will use to take an advantage of your organization. So here, it's saying penetration testing is a method, is a method again, is a methodology or a steps of evaluating security level. So we are really trying to really check is you are secure, even if you have already uh, implemented a firewall and IDS and IBS and web application firewall, are you, uh, are you secure or no? What kind of uh, things that the attacker can see from outside about you? What kind of information he can gather about you? Can he use this information to really attack you and compromise one of your systems or no? Okay, so we are playing with a very important uh, rules. It's, it's saying that's best way of defense is offense. Okay, the best way of defense is offense is basically is a very well-known strategy is saying, okay, and instead of just waiting for the attacker to attack me and then I reply or react, which is something we really ran last week when we built, when we are talking, oh, sorry, last month when we were talking about detection and uh, detection techniques and SIM and SOC engineers and all the stuff. This time, guys, we are really trying to do what? We are trying to attack our system and see what the attacker can see and quickly find remedies and find recommendation how to really secure our network. So it's penetration testing is not only about finding the vulnerabilities, and exploiting this vulnerability is also giving a recommendation. That's why uh, in the end of uh, this session or end of this course will be highlighting that, okay, I found this vulnerability, I found this vulnerability, I find this vulnerability is exploitable. How can we really help the company to find the remedies? Okay, maybe we can apply a batch. Maybe we can install another, uh, you know, uh, security controls. So your part is not only to exploit, it's also part to give you a recommendation. And that's why penetration testing is very um, is very useful because you're giving a recommendation. And that's why the stuff that we learned before in the detection systems and prevention system is, is very useful because in order to give a recommendation, you really need to have in your back mind how to can defend as well. Okay, so that's why we started by defending the system, how to defend the system. So now if we are teaching you uh, ethical hacking only in the, in the early beginning without teaching you how to defend the system, how to prevent the attacks, how to detect an attacks, okay, you will find you are missing a very important part because in the end of the day, you will have to write a report saying, you know what, this is our vulnerability and this is my recommendation for the company to cover or to really uh, mitigate the risk of these vulnerability. So how did you write this last section of recommendation? is by having a good knowledge about prevention systems and detection systems. So you really need to know about countermeasure and what kind of countermeasure exists. And we mentioned before, maybe in one of the sessions, there is type of uh, basically uh, uh, penetration testing. There's some, sometimes we call it a black, ha a black, uh, 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 black box uh, testing and white box testing and gray uh, uh, box testing. And the difference between all of them is are all of them are testing and all of them are trying to evaluate our security uh, living inside the organization and how our defenses. But some of them are really simulating an external attack. So someone doesn't know anything about you. This is a black uh, box testing and he's attacking you. So he started to really gather information about you, try to scan you, try to exploit you from an external point of view. While white testing is someone you are giving him every single information you have, and you are simulating someone internally attacking you. So this is very important. And again, we have something called gray, gray box testing, which is something in between. I'm gonna give you the obvious information that it will really uh, take you no time to find out, like my IP addresses, my DNS records, and all this stuff. 
and then I will uh, I will let you start your uh, your uh, attack or your uh, penetration testing against me. So this is all this type of uh, you know penetration testing types. Again, why it's important to know them because if you are in a company, okay, and you engage with someone externally to do the penetration testing because you don't have the capability, you need to really agree about what kind of penetration testing uh, uh, testing uh, uh, methodology you will use. So if, the, if you want them to simulate someone externally, you will go for block, uh, black, uh, black box testing and all the stuff. Okay, guys? So this is the definition, why and what type. So this is an easy way to explain why penetration testing. I wanted you always to remember penetration testing, we don't do it for fun. We do it to find vulnerabilities and that's finding vulnerabilities what we already studied before in, uh, in when we talked about risk and uh, vulnerability scanners, but this time we are validating these vulnerabilities. We wanted to see if someone, if he find this vulnerability can exploit it or no. And that is will give us a very uh, strong opinion about risk. So if we find a vulnerability from a scanner, we really not 100% sure if this someone is this false positive or no, or maybe someone can use it or no, but once we do the penetration testing and try to exploit it and exploitable, this is a hard uh, evidence that this is a vulnerability and this is we need to find a remedy for it and recommendation to how to rectify this vulnerability. So this is, I wanted you to keep in mind all the course. If you have doubt what we are doing, go back and read this specific uh, page and it will clarify a lot of stuff in your head. Okay, so we mentioned before guys that um, the uh, penetration testing is a process, okay? And this process means that I have to follow certain stages until the attacker reach his objective. We talked about uh, look uh, something similar to this, okay, from Lockheed Martin, the Kelly Chain, uh, uh, Kelly Chain uh, methodology, very similar to this, but it consists of reconnaissance, delivery, you know, and exploitation and acting. It's very similar to this. So if you look at ethical hacking or physical of, uh, or, or phases of hacking or stages of hacking, uh, there are so many techniques out there and all of them are uh, almost the same. And uh, again, the stages consist of five, okay? And you can be in an interview and easily they will ask you what kind of uh, stages that penetration testing or ethical hacking will do. Uh, so you have NIST, they have their own methodology. You have your CEH, Certified Ethical Hacking. This is their methodology. I found this is very clear and very nice. Also, uh, the Kelly chain is also very clear and very nice. We have covered before. And again, uh, ethical hacking guys phases, it consists of five stages. The first stage is called reconnaissance. And here we just gonna gather information about the target. And then we're gonna scan this target looking for a certain or certain vulnerabilities that we can use to compromise the target. Okay, once we compromise, once we find the vulnerability, we try to gain accessing using this vulnerability. Okay, so this is the stages of gaining access. Once we gain access, we'll start to really maintain our access, make sure that we are creating our backdoors, make sure that we are resistant in the systems, make sure that we really try to disable all the security tools that can cover us. Okay, make sure that we escalate privilege and be an admin in this stage. And once we have all these guys done, okay, we own this system and we own the users that own this system. And again, from here in this point for maintaining access, we can pivot our, uh, you know, attacks to another system, which is basically, we, we mentioned before, that's island hopping. And I mean, uh, that means that once I find a system that's exploitable, Maybe this system doesn't really have all the uh, information that I was looking for. So I'm gonna really use this, um, uh, this uh, system to move it or to move or lateral movement to another system, which is very important to me. So another, after maintaining access, sometimes they call it boveting or lateral movement or island hopping are the same and means that the attacker is really after something and he's started to look for it. Uh, here. So this is after maintaining a system. And finally, the attacker doesn't want really to be uh, tracked. They don't want to be really uh, to be detected. So they will try to, uh, you remember, yes, clearing uh, tracks is really important, guys, because we have, I mentioned before, we have a science called digital, uh, digital forensics. And digital forensics is all about really extracting traces, 
traces about the attacks, okay? And we mentioned so many ways, we mentioned that we can really uh, dump the uh, memory and do the order of volatility and try to extract uh, evidence from the network and from the systems and the, from processes about the attackers, uh, you know, uh, attacker traces, okay? But this is all uh, happens, but the attackers know that and they know that digital forensics is, does exist so they do their best to really cover their tracks by deleting maybe logs, by maybe encrypting all their traffic. So maybe using two networks, really hide where they are originating the IP address from by using different uh, DNS fluxes. So now you don't really know which domain they are using. So there is so many ways that attackers would do to really make sure that you, would, it, you find it very hard to track them. And again, if you cannot track them, you cannot sue them, you cannot took, take them to the court. And that's mean that they are done the perfect crime as we say in English, the perfect crime that no one knows what you have already done uh, when you commit a crime. But again, there is nothing perfect in the crime world. There is always an evidence. Okay, so what do uh, ethical hacker do? So well, we can just think in a very brief, they are they trying to uh, really answer uh, three questions. So the first question, what can the intruder see on the target systems, okay? So this is where the reconnaissance and the scanning phases is. Okay, now the attacker wanted to really see, okay, what uh, what what you have in your system? How many mail server you have? How many, uh, uh, you know, uh, websites you have? How many DNS server you have, okay? What kind of employees you, uh, you are, uh, you are uh, um, have in your organization? What their email address, okay? Can I see if this email address is easy to grab from outside? What kind of social activity you have in your uh, website? What, what is the LinkedIn profile for your company? Okay, so this is all this is gonna be done in the reconnaissance and in the scanning phases. And again, reconnaissance and the scanning phases, if you wanted really to remember, okay, think about two armies, army A, Okay, and army B. Okay, because we are we are talking about a cyber war right now. Okay, army A and army B. They wanted really to learn about each other capability, and they wanted to really understand what they can do, what is the weak points of this one, what is the strength point of this one. So they send a small group of people here to watch really what A is all about. They look at the strength point, the weak point, how many fighters they have. Okay, what kind of their uh, uh, our army tools or weapons they have. So this is, we sending a small to really study the target or study the victim, okay? And once we study the victim and we understand their point at uh, their weakness point, they start to attack. So this is the first early beginning, what really the intruder or what the hacker will see in your system. And that's why it's important to really protect the public facing service like emails and websites, because this is will be obvious uh, target for the attacks. Okay, the second question, what can an intruder do with this information? And that is basically the intruder will start to analyze this information, will start to look for a certain vulnerability, and then later on, he will start to exploit these vulnerabilities. So this is very uh, important stage. I have some information about these guys. I know where is their weak point is, so I'm gonna use this to really attack them, okay? And this is what the intruder will do. After analyzing the situation, this information will come to B. The B will analyze this information and start to look at what is vulnerability hit I can attack, okay? Uh, and this is the stages of gaining access and maintaining access. And lastly, does anyone at the target notice the intruders? This is where we are trying to do covering the tasks. It means the intruder wanted to be undetected because detection means that he either will not be able to achieve his objective or he will be busted and then, uh, you know, um, uh, and then someone can really report him to the court. Uh, so this is also uh, something uh, we do as an ethical hacker. We try to really cover uh, our tracks, okay? Uh, um, so let's talk about the first stage quickly because we don't have really, uh, I'm just gonna try to give you a brief introduction about all the stages today. And later on, we can just look at each stage specifically and what is entailed in each stage. So here, the reconnaissance phase, 
uh, sometimes they call it uh, footprinting, sometimes they call it uh, collection of information. It all uh, does have the same thing, or gathering information, it is the same thing. Reconnaissance, footprinting, gathering information. Okay, reconnaissance here, this is like a really uh, a preparation phase for hacking. The attacker seek to gather information about the target, where you to launch an attack. So this is all about gathering information. And gathering information can be done in a subtle way, and in, in a very not noticed way, and in a very aggressive way. So the, we, we have two kinds of reconnaissance. Some of them are passive reconnaissance. So I'm asking someone about you, okay, what is your capability? And some of them are really interacting with you. I'm gonna go and watch you and sending packets to you and see how you respond to these packets. So we call this active reconnaissance. So reconnaissance itself does have two uh, stages. Uh, a stage is called passive and a stage called um, uh, um, active. And we can see today, inshallah, in the labs using who's using you know dns stuff using some website will be able to gather information without really interacting with our uh, the the target machine this is all passive okay so um, this is um, again um, again in the reconnaissance after you gather the information guys this gathering information could not really reveal a lot about your target and maybe the attacker will really uh, doesn't see a value in this attack site right now but he will keep this information later on. Maybe he will use it in the future. So again, uh, right now, maybe this, inter uh, this information that he gathered it doesn't really seem interesting. And that's why he will not further go for the attack. And lastly, reconnaissance target range may include that uh, target organization clients, employees, operation network, and systems. And again, here, guys, you can see over here that, we, that when we gather information, again, what we gather information about, we gather information about IT system. And again, as I mentioned before, IT system consists of multiple component, network component, okay? So we gather information about network, operating system components, we gather information about operating systems. We gather uh, also uh, uh, information about application running on these uh, operating service and uh, uh, operating systems and services. Okay, and we also gather information about your employees if we can, because we can use later on social engineering to exploit your system. So I'm gathering information about anything that I can see on this system. So, okay, whether it's a human or whether it's a application or whether it's operating system, whether it's a network. The more information, you know, that easy for you later on to launch an attack, okay? And the also saying that if you are using certain vendor, Okay, if you are using certain application in your organization, okay, I maybe can, and you have a partnership with these guys, I maybe can really exploit this uh, uh, organization first, and then use this organization to really attack your system. And that's what we call third party attacks, or maybe uh, uh, risk uh, third party attacks, or, um, you know, a chain of attacks. Okay, so this is uh, important. <clears throat> Uh, so this is the stages of reconnaissance. I'm gonna explain another thing here in reconnaissance, guys. It's called <clears throat> passive reconnaissance and uh, active reconnaissance. And I can see, uh, like using Google Docs, I agree with uh, Shaza, okay? Uh, so using Google Docs is basically a passive reconnaissance, okay? Because you are not really interacting with the uh, target. And th in this case, we are, uh, what we're trying to do is to gather information about the target without really uh, interacting with their IDs or without interacting with the system. That's why reconnaissance as a phase divided to multiple phases is called passive reconnaissance. So attacker wanted to be really sneaky in the early beginning. They don't want anyone to see them. So here guys, passive reconnaissance involve acquiring information without directly interacting with the target, okay? So we really doesn't send anything. We can use public website to gain information about your domain name, your IBS, uh, your administrators. So this is all available online. And there is some, also, uh, you know, um, uh, application like Multigo can help you to do the same thing without also firing data into the target. How do you do this? They use, they use the search engines in the background to do search on your behalf. Okay, so this is basically the first um, uh, the first area, which is saying that we are searching public records or news release about your organization. 
if you guys look at this active uh, reconnaissance, okay, active reconnaissance means involving interacting with the target directly uh, by any means, okay? Interacting mean maybe I will send a Bing, okay? Maybe I will send uh, a trace route, okay? And see how the target is away, okay? And so we are really, if the same thing, active looking for a network and application, okay? okay? So this is really um, important uh, in this phase, guys, because we are sending data to the target and receiving something in return. So we have logs in the target saying that we were interacting with this target. Or maybe we can use NS lookup in your machine to look at certain uh, DNS record in the target. That means your machine is interacting with the target. Okay. And then also, uh, this is also an active reconnaissance. It could include social engineering. In the social engineering, you wanted to really know about this target. So you give them a call or you give me them uh, maybe a technical, uh, again, using social engineering, meaning we're trying to deceive someone in the company to reveal information. So if maybe you call this company, okay, I'm XYZ, I'm working from uh, working for this cloud provider. We wanted to know if you guys wanted any other service for a cloud provider, what cloud provider you are using right now. So I started to really uh, social with them and get more uh, data about the target machine without really uh, also, uh, without really starting the attack, but I'm gathering information about them. Okay, guys. Here is going to be uh, stage number two. Once the basically uh, the attacker gets really all this information in his hand, okay, now he started to really verify this information because you know, in the first stage, yes, I agree with Najwa. Najwa is saying that's the purpose of reconnaissance to identify many potential uh, entry point for this company. I agree with, with you, Najwa. Okay, so. Again, guys, scanning here is all about what? Scanning about, uh, right now, I gathered all this information. I, you guys um, used who is, you asked Multigo to give you a bunch of IB addresses about a certain company. Okay, I need to verify if this information is right or no. Okay, and how the attacker will verify this, guys, by doing scanning, okay? You said the IB address for company is XYZ is 10.10.10.3. .10 .10 okay. So let me right now verify if 10.23 is alive. So the first question here, they also are saying about the scanning, it's basically a pre-attack phase and the pre-attack phase, I'm trying to really verify the information that I got from the early stages of reconnaissance. I wanted really to see if it's a, the host is alive, okay, that I'm gathered, okay. I wanted to really see what kind of service running on this host, because I told you the attacker is interesting, not only about the network part, is also, uh, uh, also interesting to know about the operating system you're running, okay, and also what kind of, you know, service you're running on this machine, because every port number open, it means there's an application running in the background. So I wanted to know your operating system. I wanted to know if your uh, IB address is alive, I wanted to know which service you're running on this machine because this is could be an entry point for the attacker. Okay, either he can exploit your operating system, either he exploited one of these services running, or either he can try to really uh, get you uh, get one of your employees uh, to be fished. So in this piece of scanning, guys, I wanted to achieve three things. I wanted to verify the IP address. I wanted to see what port number, what service you're running, what operating system you're running, and also. Uh, this is will assist the attacker to really launch his attack later on. Uh, so attacker extract information such as computer names, okay, IP addresses and user account to launch attack, okay? Why? Because if in order really guys to attack a system, you should be able to at least have a username, okay? So if you get the username, okay, if you know what port number is open, you can really try something like, uh, you know, uh, password tools, to hijack the password and look into the systems. So this is what attacks is all about. You gain uh, access to the system using the username and password. So the username and password to allow you to log into the system. So this is also in the scanning phase. You collect uh, IB, you collect uh, borders open, you collect vulnerabilities, because once you understand uh, uh, what IP address, what service is running, what operating system, you can search, start to search looking at certain uh, vulnerability here. And again, searching for vulnerability guys can be done in two ways. 
the first way of searching on the laboratory can be a uh, manual way. So you know that's an operating system here. Let me go on the database uh, website, the NIST database website, and let me see if this specific uh, vulnerability does exist, or this specific system does have a vulnerability, and then I can literally, later on download one of these vulnerabilities or the, one of these exploits from database, ex, uh, database uh, exploit, and really uh, use it to against this system. Uh, or maybe I found one of these services running here is vulnerable. I can really search, uh, on, uh, on, uh, search online uh, for this vulnerability and find an exploit for it. So this is scanning vulnerabilities also happening in the scanning phase. And again, guys, uh, here is, uh, it can be done manually. So the attacker can go take one of these systems and go look for it online. Or he can do this, guys, by uh, automated way. And this is, I think, this is the most uh, common way for the attacker to, do, to use. It's basically, if, you if he's scanning 10 servers, it will make sense for him to scan all these 10 servers. He will can fit the, the scanner here with 10 different IP address and say you can go and search for vulnerability here. So the, the vulnerability scanners can be used by the attacker, can be used by us as an ethical hacking uh, for finding vulnerabilities in a more automated way. And once we find the vulnerability, guys, the attacker will try to find and exploit if this is our uh, not advanced attackers, because you know we have two types of attackers. We have the script KD, we have also the APTs. So script KDs, guys, will use one exploit that is already published in the, in the, in the public. They will or use a framework for exploitation like Metasploit. So they will use the, the tools that exist already in the market to exploit system. But what if you are really dealing with really high intelligence, uh, uh, super funded uh, attackers, they can develop their own tools to exploit your system. So this is what will take us gaining access uh, once we find the vulnerability in this stage, as I mentioned, okay, the attackers, again, they will have two routes here, okay, the first route is um, basically is if it's really well known vulnerability, so why not, I can download, exploit and exploit the system, and exploitation means, guys, I'm gaining access to the system, as you can see, you remember, I give you once, uh, uh, maybe a very nice uh, diagram of house, and this house, someone left the door open, and this house, the attacker see the door open and he used this to enter the house. This is what exploitation is all about, gaining access to the system. And the gaining access, again, guys, coming from the following uh, two uh, methodology. Either if we have uh, a really uh, new attackers, okay, they will use a framework uh, that's like core impact, like maybe Metasploit, uh, they use Kali Linux. So this is means, doesn't mean that really are, they are really advanced, but we have another, a way to gain access, which is we are dealing with ABTs or we're dealing with nation states. And these guys would be having their own tools and they having their own teams to even develop, develop uh, exploit for vulnerabilities. And developing exploit for vulnerability, you can take a course for it online. There are so many ways, but it really requires you to be really good in programming because now you're gonna write the code that can cause buffer overflow, or can really cause uh, uh, SQL injections, you really need to be able to write a code in this stage, especially if you develop your own tools. You can get access again, guys, here, refer to the point where the attacker obtain access to the operating system, operating system or application or the computer networks. So once the attackers can gain access or even to one of the user's uh, uh, credential, like username and password using social engineering, means he find a way to get into your systems, Okay, the attacker can gain access to the operating system level or the application level or the network level. Okay, uh, the attacker can escalate privilege to obtain complete control of the system. So once the attacker really managed to exploit your system, the first thing that the attacker would love to have is to have a full uh, permission or the admin permission or the root permission. And that's why we do something called privilege escalation. We'll exploit, um, well, uh, and then uh, some of these uh, some of these examples include password cracking, okay? You know, buffer overflow, denial of service, uh, session hijacking. Taman, I don't agree about denial of service is kind of a tax because it's not gonna give you gain access. So this is, I would say it's a wrong to add denial of service here. I would say that session hijacking is definitely buffer overflow, password cracking. Because end of the day, guys, what the attacker really want to do, okay, is, 
uh, basically uh, he wants us really to get into your system, to have an access to your system, okay? And in order to have an access to your system, in the scanning phase or the uh, reconnaissance phase, he can get your email. Okay, once he have the email address, now all he, what he really needs to get to your system is the second part of the puzzle, which is basically maybe the password, okay, to gain access to the system. Okay, how can they do this? They can do this by social engineering. Maybe they can call the whole disk and ask them to reset the password. So now if he has the email address from the first stage, now he has the password as well. Maybe if you don't protect your password, uh, you remember that we have studied something called password complicity, password history, uh, uh, password lockout policy after how many times? Okay, injection attacks is definitely also Abtisam is an attack that will allow him to gain access because you remember in injection attacks, what happened is guys, when you inject the code to inside the server, okay, if the server doesn't really handle uh, this code in a proper way, so we didn't have an input validation, this code will be executed and then it will be releasing a lot of information or even sometimes in SQL injection, he can bypass the username and password area and he can be logged into the system. So we have seen once I have maybe explained once for you guys, how that the attackers can really uh, slash slash the password and now the, the system will, will syndicate him with even with no password included. So SQL injection and all this type of injection, if you can guys can really remember the XSS is all about having your session or executing something to really get to your cookies and your session. And once I have a your session, I have basically an access to your system. So injection in, uh, attacks is also one of the ways that we have again access. Uh, to the system. Okay, uh, so now if he's saying or impersonating, he can obtain info. Yes, this is uh, social engineering is big. And that's why social engineering right now really in race because we already advancing our really uh, uh, prevention techniques and detection techniques. So the attackers are also looking for the easy way. Okay, sometimes the, some attackers, they want to really the, the, the easy way. I want to use a name and password, okay? Let me simplify this. The easy one, uh, way to really obtain this is by to really trick someone to give me his username and password. If I got this, that's fine, Halas, I got the access that I want. Only the part that I really need to work on is right now is privilege escalation. And that's why you also have right now a lot of you know organization, they apply multi-factor authentication, they apply BAM solution, which is privilege access management. Why? Because they are not worried really from the you know normal user because normal user, if he doesn't have a permission, he cannot do a lot. But what we worried about, if this guy is an admin now in the machine, and he's admin in the machine, he can install extra information, he can crack passwords, he can crack hashes, he can do a lot of damage. And that's why we need to really uh, uh, monitor uh, the admin uh, privilege and the users in admin groups. Uh, and apply someone for sure multi-factor authentication. So anyway, we finish gaining access. Again, guys, uh, this is all going to be lectures in the future. So I'm, I'm just briefing you about this. We need to cover. I'm just giving you like <clears throat> the holistic picture. Uh, Once we have already uh, done uh, the gaining access, we wanted to maintain access. Means I wanted really to be able to come back to the systems whenever I want. I want to really later on uh, to be able, even if the system is started or if the network connectivity is disconnected and come back, so I will be able to come back to the systems. I really wanted to really be resistant. Resistance means I wanted to be there all the time. Okay, why? Because it takes time from the attacker to really achieve their objective. Maybe their objective is to steal your database or maybe their objective is to install, uh, you know, ransom in your network. So this is uh, not gonna happen in one session. Okay, it takes some sessions and it takes some reconnaissance from the attacker to understand what kind of environment you have and he scan your environment even internally. So even in maintaining access, guys, I will have another reconnaissance because now I, I got my feet in the first island within your organization. I really need to look at what you else you have. So sometimes the attacker will do another reconnaissance. We call this exploitation reconnaissance. We're looking at systems that I wanted to really later on to move to uh, in the future. So here is um, what we, we mentioned in this specific 
uh, case is called maintaining access is I wanted really to give resistance. I wanted to add myself to registry. I wanted to add myself to the schedule uh, service. I wanted to add to myself to more stable uh, processes so I can come back again. I wanted really to uh, have a uh, root privilege also. I wanted to evade if there is some extra, you know, um, detection techniques and protection techniques inside the network, I wanted to evade it or I wanted really to disable it from the system so it will it doesn't really make a lot of fuss about me existing in the network, okay? Most of the people who, who try to do that are ABT attackers. No, even normal attackers will do this. Uh, Shaza, because I wanted to really be on your system, okay? So if someone is hacking, you know, one person, uh, once he get an access to the system, this is game over. Khalas, he doesn't want to really, maybe he will steal the information he has. Maybe he will steal his username and password for a bank, and that's it, okay? This is what I really wanted from a one person. But when I'm talking about the entire organization, it comes back to really what the attacker objective is. Are they are motivated by money? Okay, then they will make sure that they install uh, ransom in your network, okay? Uh, if they are motivated by nation states, okay, and then uh, their objectives can really be espionage, and yani they can spy on you, or can be really uh, vandalism, they can destroy, they wanted to destroy your network and destroy your assets. So they uh, will, any of them, they will, tr they will make sure that they are gonna be resistant. One of the reasons also comes to my mind of being resistance because the attackers will try to really uh, cover uh, the vulnerability they used to get to your system. Why? Because they don't want any other attacker to use the same vulnerability to get into your system. So they will try to close this vulnerability and use another vulnerability or use another backdoor for the attacker only to come back. Okay, so this is will also another reason why they wanted to be resistant. Okay, maintaining accents refer the phase when the attacker tries to retain his or her ownership of the systems, mean that I wanted to be all the time and exist in the systems, okay? Uh, yes, yeah, they will try to really, uh, you know, mitigate the risk of another attacker to take advantage of you. Attacker may prevent the system from being owned by another attacker by securing their exclusive access with backdoor, root kill, or dragon. So this is the point that I was explaining one second ago. Okay, and then you have here the attacker can upload, download, or manipulate data, application, and configuration on the own on the own systems. Attacker use compromised system to launch further attacks. This is what I was telling you guys. There is something called post exploitation. That means post exploitation that I will try to really reach to the system that does have a lot of information that can cause issues for the company, which is basically databases, okay, you know, a file server that has a lot of information, maybe a trade secrets for this organization that has a lot of also intellectual uh, property for this uh, uh, organization. So I, the, the attacker wanted to stay, he wanted to stay. I wanted to be able to come back whenever I want. I wanted to be able to log in whenever I want. And I don't want to, anyone to use the same vulnerability I used to get inside the house inside your system. So this is also maintaining access. And lastly, we will be talking about also, you know, this phase is specifically maintaining access that we could sometimes post exploitation does have a lot of categories. And there is a lot of things that the attacker can do to stay here, like uh, uh, DLL hijacking and all this stuff. We'll explain it later on. Uh, but, uh, but I'm just giving you guys again a brief today. We cannot cover everything in ethical hacking in one day, so we're taking it uh, easy, and we have, inshallah, three weeks to cover everything. Okay, so covering tracks, as uh, Naif said at the beginning, and I have said in the beginning, I want to really to make sure no one can track me, no one can really extract digital evidence that I have compromised the system, no one can take an, uh, maybe a sample of my malware that I used, because once they have the sample of my malware, uh, then they, they can really tell who I am by really analyzing the sample, looking for the data inside the sample, you know, and doing all the static analysis and dynamic analysis. So all this stuff, guys, I wanted to hide. So the attackers will, will make sure that he will delete any tools he used. He will delete any logs that exist in the systems. Um, uh, they, they, why they use sometimes BBM? They really use VBN sometimes. They use sometimes also tour networks to hide how many uh, 
uh, tour networks will explain it later on also uh, in this course, how we use tour network to really hide our IP address. So no one can really trace where we come from. And if you are really, um, uh, you're upsetting FBI or maybe NSA, you will not be able to hide using two networks, but usually two networks can be able to hide your network tracks. Uh, so covering tracks with the, the activity carried by, out by an attacker to hide uh, malicious acts like the tools he used, you know, the extraction information that he used, the traces that exist in the log files, and the network uh, also traces. Uh, he, the attacker, intention include uh, continuing access to the victim system, renaming unnoticed and unquote uh, deleting evidence that might lead to the prosecutions. So I wanted really to evade uh, being detecting. And later on, I wanted really to make sure no one can really uh, take me to the court because I hacked his system. The attacker override the server system and application logs to avoid uh, suspicions activity. Why? Because again, we have an entire, uh, entire uh, team, the SOC team is looking at your systems and looking at your logs all the time. Okay, and looking at the network feeds as well and looking for as uh, application feeds as well. Okay, and looking at the users as well. Okay, so this is where the attacker want, wanted to make sure that these logs does not gonna go to basically to the same team because the same team once they find something suspicious, they will start to investigate and this is would be game over for the attacker. So the attacker want to quickly to manipulate and delete and you know uh, play with these logs so it doesn't really see shows anything suspicious, which is where require the SIP team to really raise an incident and really investigate this incident. That's why you can see guys the incident response and the SOC teams and you know uh, and uh, the attackers are playing in the same field. We you know, we notice someone is intruding to us. He wanted to cover his track quickly. We wanted to detect him as quickly as possible and respond to this attack as, 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 as soon as possible to really contain the damage that he can use. So you can understand now the big picture here. We are in a war, okay? And whoever is really uh, prepared for this war, he will win. So this is basically what uh, I can do, okay? And please, privacy. How can SOC team do all this without Iblis consent? Okay. Uh, when you are really working in an organization, the first thing uh, you have uh, is basically um, is something called acceptable user policy. And the policy was saying basically, uh, you know, uh, exactly. I agree with Shaza. We must hunt them down before they cause uh, really damage to our organization. Uh, so this is exactly why they will hire you as a SOC engineer. They will hire you as a SOC engineer. They will hire you as an information security engineer to really uh, detect these bad guys or to, to prevent them to really cause damage to your environment. So it's very good to understand what is their mentality is, what is the attacker mentality is in order to really stop them. And that's why we studied the MITRE attacks and we studied every single uh, techniques and procedures the attacker to do and also we give you uh, a really nice mitigation in the MITRE attack. And that's why I, I told you guys when I explained the MITRE attack, MITRE attack is very useful, especially if you work in the detection team or prevention teams, because now you understand what is techniques the attackers are using to really exploit your system. So you really better, it will allow you to better defend your system. So it's MITRE attack again. Uh, uh, if I got the chance, I would explain it one more time because it's really important. Okay, especially if you work in the incident response or something or SOC engineer. Okay, um, again, I will be back to a uh, naive question about uh, privacy. I'm sorry, you don't have privacy in the, inside their network. Once you are in, inside the network, you will be uh, agreeing about that, uh, that the company will be able to monitor uh, the employees' activities. And in some organization, I have seen this, when you log in, you, it, you will get a notification message saying, all your uh, action uh, inside our networks is monitored, okay? So they basically uh, giving you a, a banner saying that you are, everything is monitored. 
Okay, so anything you do on your computer is monitored. And then later on, if the employees are violating the acceptable user policy, they can be terminated. They can be, uh, you know, uh, disciplined. There is a disciplinary or penalties actions. So um, if you work in an organization, uh, even if they don't this say this out of loud, they are monitoring everything. Uh, and again, when you accept the end user acceptable policy and the IT policy, you're basically accepting that you. Taban, some a lot of people they don't really need, read these policies. But these policies are giving the company the rights to really look into the system and what they do. Uh, this is will encourage employees to be OED with their own internet. Okay, this is, to be honest, I don't mind if someone uh, bring his own device and use his internet to uh, to access <laughs> uh, to access uh, to access uh, to access the internet. Okay, uh, I don't really mind uh, if he can bring. Uh, his own device, as long as he's not part of my network, it doesn't cause me any damage, okay? As long as he, I didn't include him in, inside my network, even if he downloaded something malicious in his own uh, uh, computer or in his own uh, mobile, I don't care. I don't give like really uh, rat ass about it. I'm just to care about what is inside my network, okay? And that's why really it's important to really understand what kind of devices you have inside your organization. Okay, and you monitor everything. Okay, and I had a meeting yesterday or the day before with someone as working as a consultant in a in a crypto exchange, and he said we need to monitor every single thing happening in this network. Okay, this is the most important thing. We wanted to understand what the user do, what the customer do, what the client do, and what is our partner do. Every single thing should be monitored and stored in a cloud watch or a cloud storage. And we'll be able to analyze analyze it later on. So everything should be monitored. Uh, okay, again, guys, let's back to this again. Type of attacks. If you can, guys, see the type of attacks in the system. There is so many attacks. Why? Because our IT system will compromise a lot of areas. Okay, so this areas would be um, would be something like. Uh, Operating system attacks. There is network attacks. Okay, we have studied some before how uh, network attacks can be done. There's something can be done in the layer two, uh, and this layer two it includes something called R poisoning. So R poisoning can lead to one of the middle attacks, and uh, or DNS poisoning can be really redirect you to a website owned by the attackers. So this is all can be done on the network level. Okay, or maybe you have VLAN hobbing. So many attacks that can be done in 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 in, 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 a, in a operating in, sorry in the network level. So many attacks also can happen on the operating system. Again, our operating system guys is a massive huge code that is there and it has so many applications. And so some of the applications are vulnerable. The media player can be vulnerable. Your browser can be vulnerable. Okay, your uh, your uh, even your Word and Excel and all this stuff that comes with it. Uh, even the WordPress is also vulnerable. So there is so many things that uh, the operating system itself is vulnerable, okay? That's why every day or every month, or every week, you have a fine, fine Microsoft are releasing a lot of uh, a lot of updates, security updates, okay? Why? Because you, the operating system is vulnerable and there is so many things that we don't know about the operating system because why? Because our windows are not open source, okay? So. Only the vendors know about this vulnerability, and that's why we end up finding sometimes zero days. How this zero days comes? It's someone who's working as a security researcher. He research Windows, and he research how Windows react to a certain input, and then he can exploit this input. So we have so many vulnerabilities and operating system. We have so many uh, vulnerabilities because the application. We install application like PDF, Acrobat Reader, Outlook, you know, all this, uh, uh, you know, Zoom, all this kind of application that we install is also part of, uh, uh, part of, uh, part of it is big codes. And these big codes can be really vulnerable and can allow the attacker to take an advantage. So, so this is a way also. Okay, that's why, again, I will connect this to my, what I said in scanning. What the attacker do in the scanning is try to look at what operating system you have, what application you have, what network you have, devices, okay, what kind of network you are connected to, because this is will allow him to find vulnerability and attack this later on. So this is another thing. Also, we have also misconfigurations. 
means uh, attacks means that you have a system which is was secure by default, but what end up you doing what you end up you didn't configure it properly, so it can really echo. So you get like really nice uh, wireless router, but you really didn't implement it it eight hundred two dot one x security uh, protocol to really secure your um, your uh, your wireless, or you didn't apply WPS three. So you end up with a vulnerability that will allow the attacker to take advantage of it. As you know, there's so many attacks. I have, uh, I, I, I will highlight some of them here. As you can see, there's so many attacks, even dropping uh, identity spoofing, snobbing attacks, interceptions, replay attacks. This is all guys kind of attacks that maybe we have already talked about it in a really uh, quick way, but uh, in these sections, and uh, especially on the gaining access, we can we can start to look at kind of these attacks and how can you. Misconfiguration in the top 10 uh, OWASP. Yes, I agree. So misconfiguration uh, it can really cause a lot of, uh, I would say, damage. Uh, so it's really important, guys, to, uh, to be able to really handle uh, configuration when you put a system. A brand new system, you need to really handle the configuration in a really uh, great de uh, details. Okay, so I cannot really talk about all this attack right now, but we will pass password guessing attacks. Okay, you can tell from the name, spoofing attacks, backdoor attacks, man in the middle. So we'll be looking at these attacks later on. Okay, so again, what is we must follow the correct step for con con configurations? I agree with Shaza. Uh, we got an AS site system by default, guys. Whoever created this system, it doesn't want the system to be compromised because this is really bad for him. Okay, so if your system is compromised and it has bad reputation, no one will buy your system. So they will implement all the security requirements to make sure that the system is secure. And a lot of organizations now they're taking the SDLC, the secure life cycle, or DevOps or DevSecOps in a very serious way. And that's exactly what we really wanted uh, to happen: is to take our uh, systems in a, uh, in our configuration in a very uh, serious way to stop any further attacks. So here, operating system attacks I have already talked about. Attacker will search for vulnerabilities and exploit them to gain access. Okay, there's so many exploits for Windows and so many exploits for Linux and even Mac OS. Okay, some of us uh, of these OS vulnerability is buffer overflow bugs in the operating system, unbatched operating system. So unbatched operating system is really horrible thing because you now basically uh, the operating system is very obvious. It's gonna be a very obvious point for the attacker, especially if you don't update the system. And that's why we studied something in the prevention techniques it's called uh, batch management. And what is batch management cycle is all about and how you batch the system in a big organization. This is really important thing to look at guys. So here is also, we can go back ahead and we talk about, you know, also we have the application attacks and how many application attacks running inside the organization and how can this is application is can be used to attack you. So if you're running, the, uh, for example, a vulnerable uh, website uh, version in your organization and the attacker will find out about this vulnerability, he can exploit uh, the web server if you're running a vulnerable database, you can use this database to attack you. If you're running, for example, mail server, exchange mail server that is vulnerable, the attacker can use it to exploit your, uh, your and the, all of these attacks are really there out there in the public. So the, what the attacker will need to do is to research after he find the version and after he find what application you have, which version. If you are using your Zoom in your computer and this Zoom is very old, it can be really, uh, it can allow the attacker to take advantage of it, okay? So where I can find all these attacks, as I mentioned, the attacks, guys, can to be in a two flavor. You can find a framework that is full of the attacks and exploit, and we will be talking about something called Metasploit later on, and this Metasploit is full of attacks that's ready to launch against the target. It's easy steps to really, a launch an attack against type using the Metasploit and using core impact. Some framework are there that just made for attacks. So this is gonna make it easy for the attacker to attack, or you can really take the hard way and develop your own exploits. And that will require you some knowledge about uh, you know, programming. And that's why I see 
a lot of potential importance for programming in the uh, penetration testing. And that's why if we got sometimes uh, in this course, maybe Abir or myself will teach you a little bit about bash programming and how to do programming using bash. And this is very useful tools for the penetration testers, okay? We should move, remove or disable any un, unneeded ports and service to, mashallah, I see Agar Ghazwa is saying very uh, good statement here. We really need, and that's why we do ethical hacking. Uh, we, we really uh, do uh, ethical hacking, guys, is to find these vulnerabilities and this uh, running service that we don't know about it before the bad guys find about it. Okay, and also I mentioned there is also misconfiguration uh, and the misconfiguration, as you can see here, uh, I'll just show you guys, there's so many misconfiguration and this misconfiguration can be in the network devices, can be in your operating system. If you didn't install uh, any updates, this is considered many uh, misconfiguration. If you didn't really uh, turn on your firewall in your phone, and sorry, in your desktop is misconfiguration. This is all misconfiguration that can happen also in the application level, in the operating system level, or in the network level. So this is all things that we wanted to really uh, cover today. And again, I, I just wanted to tell you before we go uh, for a break is here, you can see what is really ethical hacking is necessary, why we need it. I explained why the penetration testing is important. Again, I'm emphasizing this point because this point is really important. Here, ethical hacking is a necessary because it's allow uh, it allows a countering of attack from malicious, from malicious um, hacker by uh, by anticipating methods they can use to break into our systems. So we are trying to really anticipate how the attacker will attack our system and try to cover this area before the bad guys find about this area. And why this is why ethical hacking is important. So this is um, uh, important. Once we find about these areas, okay, that can be, uh, uh, can allow the attacker to exploit us. Again, we return to this uh, important fact, which is okay, in order really to implement security, okay, and find uh, controls and implement, uh, you know, um, I would say um, uh, defenses, I need to implement the ideology of defense and depths that I will make my computer or data is very hard to reach by implementing policies or physical controls or network controls or host controls or application controls. So it will be very hard for the attacker to get into my data. So this is basically what I wanted to cover today. And this is the skills of an ethical hacker. What kind of skills I need to have in order to be an ethical hacker? You need to have technical knowledge, you have the need to have security knowledge, need to have to be computer experts so you know about operating system and all this stuff. You need to have a network uh, knowledge so you know about hubs, switches, routers, and how network works, how protocol works, TCP, IP. And you also need to have platform knowledge, which is IB, uh, sorry, knowledge about, you know, Windows operating system, Linux, uh, Unix operating system, and all this stuff. So this is what allow you to be a really good hacker. Add to this also, if you really wanted to be a really, uh, very uh, skilled uh, ethical hacker, you need, need to know a little bit of programming as well. I will add to this specific uh, uh, page over here. Okay, guys, so far so good. Okay, so this is my end of the lecture today. Do you guys have any questions, any um, anything that you have in your mind? Okay, I think this is will be uh, good. Um, uh, so this is the introduction for ethical hacking. I have uh, covered everything that we really need to understand in the early beginning, why we do ethical hacking, stages of ethical hacking, uh, and Ustaz Abtihal saying we need more, but don't worry, we'll get you more, don't worry, it's just uh, after the break, so. Tell us, do you hack before? Do you, I got hacked before or I hacked someone before? No, I used I used to really do this for fun, just to hack. Yes, to to this is how I really got interested by IT. Uh, is like early beginning when I started to have a computers, and this is was really interesting to read about uh, the first program we used to have to hack uh, with. This is, was a long time ago, but you still find this program. 
sub seven. I don't know if you have ever heard about sub seven um, uh, attacks, but it was fun. It, uh, it, it, it used to, yeah. Yes, maybe one day, maybe one day I decide to be the bad guy, but I really find hacking is, I would say that uh, we make sure, alhamdulillah, that we make money out of the good sources. Uh, you can hack and you can get a lot of money, but it's haram. End of the day, we have to have some morals, right? Okay, uh, so uh, again with you, um, uh, I will go, uh, I will hack only if, if, if I find someone is aggressive against my country, I would do hack them, I have hack the shit out of them, but, uh, but, uh, but not for, uh, not just for fun again. Uh, so, um, or says uh, cool. you can do this, you can do this. Inshallah, there is uh, um, uh, an organization called CERT. And if you work for CERT, uh, it's an organization that's basically looking after the cybersecurity for the entire nation. Okay, uh, they do something like this. They do have ethical hacking and they do have also uh, defense and depth uh, engineers. Uh, so it's really interesting. You guys can uh, apply for CERT. Or at least get a training insert. They uh, sometimes they announce uh, training insert. I'm sure that Saudi Arabia does have cert. You can Google it, uh, case A cert, and it's interesting. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, guys, I'll give you uh, 25 minutes today. Okay, uh, for yes, Abi. Uh, so we had a session with the all of cohorts. So I'll move them, and I work with them afternoon session. On the recon. Okay. When uh, when Sumi is at eleven. Is. At eleven, I'll share the link with them. Uh, he will make okay. a for all of cohorts, even on site and online cohorts. So I think it's okay, great. good to share their knowledge between all of students. It's a good experience okay. for them. Okay, guys. After so that, we're gonna I'll, go for I'll be Sumi. back in the afternoon session, and I work with them with Asad. I give them a okay. session and also I said. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what, Abir. Let's assume me do the session today. You get some rest. And Asad will do it also afternoon. And you uh, do your session tomorrow after okay. my uh, morning class. Okay, okay no problem. No so problem. guys, we will be, okay. Uh, so 11 o'clock, guys, we will have a session with Sumi. This is for everyone. So this is kind of uh, a session that everyone uh, will have. So let's go uh, for this session today, inshallah. And tomorrow, okay, guys, we'll be uh, looking for a beer session after my uh, printing, uh, scanning, and enum. Okay, okay, guys. So I will uh, I will let you guys go for a break right now, and Abir will share you in Discord which uh, which uh, session uh, which uh, which link you need to log in in order to see some. Actually, okay, they asked for a session with you, Sherry. Oh, ask a session. <laughs> nice, with told you that we need a session with Sherry. Ah, okay. So don't worry, we have session every every day with me, and inshallah, in some sessions we do exploitation with with each other. Don't worry. Okay. okay. We will do uh, by the okay, by great. the end of the next week, we'll make a machine try to hack it. All of you. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yes, that's good. I'll we make it. Also it will be ready by the end of the next week. Okay, great. Okay, guys, I will see you guys uh, afternoon. Uh, so enjoy the session with Sumi. To like to learn as much as you can from these sessions because the practical session is really important. See you guys. Yeah. Okay, thank you.